Okay. Let's see here. And Fred Fraley and Kevin Keith, if you could go ahead and unmute yourselves and start your video feeds, uh, we'll get going with the next presentation here. Kevin, good morning, Kevin. Hello, how are you? Very well, how are you? Good, doing really great this morning. And Fred, I see you. Yes, yes. Hello, everybody from Fraley World Headquarters in the Colorado <laughs> Rockies. <laughs> good morning. All right, let me get the next presentation shared. Okay. And Ken, this is just a reminder to make sure we're recording. I think we are, but I just, uh, I wanted to get that reminder out there. All right, so our next presenters are Fred W. Fraley and Kevin P. Keith, who are going to tell you more about Jay Parker Lamb and his incredible photography that began during the steam to diesel transition in the 1950s. Fred has been writing about railroads for longer than I've been alive. He has written for Trains Magazine for more than 40 years and recently ended a long stint as one of its columnists. His new book, Last Train to Texas, is just out from Indiana University Press, joining his other classics, including Blue Street Merchandise and my favorite, Twilight of the Great Trains. A Texas native, Fred studied journalism at the University of Kansas and worked at the Kansas City Star, Chicago Sun-Times, and U.S. News and World Report before he enjoyed a long tenure as editor of Kiplinger's Personal Finance. Kevin is a member of our board of directors, as well as a columnist and blogger for Classic Trains Magazine. He studied journalism at Michigan State University, he worked for 11 years in daily newspapers, and then spent 29 years at Combat Publishing Company, where he was a member of the train staff for 13 years, including eight as editor. He later served as the magazine's publisher, and he retired in 2016 as Combach's Vice President Editorial. His book, 1225, The Life and Times of a Steam Locomotive, won the 2016 Notable Book Award from the Library of Michigan. And I will turn over, I'm gonna stop sharing just for a minute so Fred and Kevin can say hello to everyone, and then uh, guys, I'll get your presentation started again right after, uh, right after you've said hi. Take it away, gentlemen. Okay. Um, we're here to talk about a person who's one of my favorite people and arguably my favorite railroad photographer. Uh, Parker Lamb was born in 1933 in uh, a little town, uh, overwhelmingly African American, in far western Alabama. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the name because I can't pronounce it. Uh, his father, uh, Parker Sr., worked with his grandfather at a blacksmith's uh, shop in this little village and uh, he uh, the blacksmith shop kind of segued into an auto repair garage and when parker was uh, barely able to walk dad moved the family across the state line into mississippi and opened an auto repair place in meridian now Meridian was easily the railroad capital of Mississippi. You had the Illinois Central, the Southern Railway, Gulf Mobile in Ohio, and, and uh, the Meridian and Bigby short line. And by the age of eight, uh, in that very permissive era, uh, Parker had a bicycle and was free to roam the entire city from yard to yard to yard. And he was in junior high school when his mother asked if she if he wanted her old folding Kodak camera. Parker said, no, mom. But in half an hour later, he, he dug it out of the trash. And there began his lifetime of photography. Uh, nobody told him, though, that uh, he had to hold the camera still when you do an exposure. So his first roll of film was ruined. But before long, he was uh, he was uh, a member of the high school camera club, and began a a, a lifetime of uh, work in the darkroom. The thing is that Parker became uh, an adult without ever meeting another rail fan, which is hard to imagine today. Uh, he did, however, go to Auburn to study mechanical engineering, uh, like father, like son, I guess and uh, took with him an Argus C3. And at the age of 20, he sent Morgan at trains a uh, envelope of eight by 10s because he had noticed there were no, there were no uh, 
photographs are very few in trains from his part of the country. And uh, Morgan was so taken by this that uh, it, uh, this was 1954, by the way, and he was a month away from his 20th anniversary when trains uh, published the first photograph of his. In the next year, in 1955, uh, this was. I I had just discovered trains myself, and with the fourth issue that I bought at the, my village's newsstand was a celebration by Morgan of his 12 favorite photographers. And they were the usual crowd, Hastings, Shaughnessy, Steinheimer. Uh, but there was this kid, Parker Lamb, uh, who, who, as I said, was not even, had just turned 21 then. And his photograph of a Southern Railway freight train, a going away shot, and it was his pick. Uh, and I, I, I noted that and I, he was so young, uh, and I was only 11 at the time, so I kind of identified with him. And after that, I always uh, recognized a Parker Lamb shop because if it, if it was in the South and it was a well-posed photo of diesels, it almost had to be. J.P. Lamb Jr. So, Kevin, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk a while. Well, you got to know uh, Parker a lot sooner than I did, Fred. I discovered uh, Parker in 1965 when my mother got me my first subscription to Trains Magazine, which was this issue, which was a great issue to start out your sub with. Uh, this was November 65, the 25th anniversary issue. And a shout out to Victor Hand, who I hope is watching today, a fantastic cover shot that Morgan shows of the B&O freight train. But inside were several essays by Morgan about various topics relating to the last uh, 25 years of railroad history. And uh, each was a set of photographs with one of these uh, frontispiece type prose poems by Morgan. And the last one was called, uh, is it dawn or is it twilight? And we'll see it here in a second. Uh, this was the way that the whole feature section of the magazine ended. And uh, I urge anyone to, to, to try and find this issue and read it. And of course, this is a wonderful essay by Morgan to wrap the whole thing up. And it, 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 typical of Parker, that there's just so much going on in the photograph. Here we see a seaboard airline freight uh, behind Jeep 30s approaching a signal in Raleigh, North Carolina. And on the adjacent track is another freight train loaded with uh, pickup trucks or trucks of some kind uh, and other cars and uh, uncovered, I might note, back in those days. And uh, it was a perfect photo to end the issue on because you really can't tell whether it's dawn or twilight. But uh, I was struck by the photograph. I was already overwhelmed by everything I'd read, I'd read in the pages leading up to that. And by this time, it didn't take me long to start absorbing every last little detail in Trains Magazine. And that included the little agate type credit lines in the lower right-hand corner here, J.P. Lamb Jr. So that name registered with me almost from the, the beginning of my being, being a Trains Magazine reader. What resonates with me in that photo, Kevin, is the uh, the signal mast, the back of it, used as, as kind of the the framework for the photo. Uh, I'm, I'm just struck by that, particularly the little tippy tippy tip of the top that's uh, black. I love it. Parker was was in Raleigh because that was his first job after obtaining his doctorate in mechanical engineering. He at uh, the uh, university in Raleigh, and he stayed there about three years. Now, this was taken. You want to talk about this one though first? Yeah, this is a shot uh, taken in near Dayton, in Dayton, Ohio. This was during his time with the Air Force in Ohio. This was a very rich couple of years for Parker. Uh, because he got to shoot a lot of railroads that are pretty much the only shot when he was there, uh, the B&O, the New York Central, some others in that area. And a nice mix of stuff by Parker because he shot during the wintertime, he shot steam and diesel, the, the transition era was still very much alive. Plus this wonderful shot contrasting two eras really, uh, uh, the one on the right of course is this gorgeous B&O Pacific on a passenger train on the left, curiously enough, is the General Motors Aero Train, which was a failed experiment, and uh, I think possibly one of the ugliest trains ever created. But uh, I love the fact that Parker was there on a day when he could make this wonderful shot showing the contrast of the two. 
We uh, next see uh, the Illinois Central Seminole uh, heading north in uh, Champaign, Illinois. Uh, I like this for a very simple reason. The uh, switch crew is waving at the passenger train. And uh, that's so typical of, of Parker, how he, how he uses people or he employs people in his photographs to make them stand out. It's a nice shot. Yep. I always associated Parker with the diesel locomotive. Uh, the Southern Railways dieselized before those in other regions because frankly, their steam locomotives were worn out. Their bridges were light, couldn't support big new steam locomotives. Uh, and the, but but he was fascinated by steam. And uh, after his retirement uh, from academia, wrote a, a great book, uh, Affecting the American Steam Locomotive. Yeah, this is a book that I use a lot. Anybody who follows my blog on the Classic Trains website knows I write about steam a lot, and that book uh, is well worn. I'm constantly pulling it off the shelf, and uh, very glad that Lamb did that. Uh, we're now in Austin, Texas, where the Katy and Missouri Pacific cross, and. Uh, this is another uh, example of Parker's use of, of framework and composition. The Katy, uh, a coal train is uh, blocking the way of a Missouri Pacific train as God intended it always should. <laughs> you like that air hose too, don't you, Kevin? Yeah, I think the air hose is wonderful. I mean, it's just there, but it's there's something about the way it's lit up and the way it, it's uh, linking the airline between the two cars. It's, uh, nice, it's a nice little bit of symbolism. True. Uh, Parker was known for his pan shots. Uh, this one is the uh, Missouri Pacific Southerner somewhere in Arkansas. It's a hot day. It's hot even in the engine room. The doors are open. Uh, and uh, I once said to him, Parker, you were so good at pan shots, but you ought to be dead. And, you know, trying to follow these trains at high speed. And he says, Fred, I was standing still. I just moved my body. And I feel like a fool. I've been, uh, you know, I risked my life trying to do pan shots, and I could have, I could have saved a lot of trouble. This is a, a superb example. I love this. He was a master at that. Here's a shot that really struck me. This is we're standing at the Oak Street Yard of the Illinois Central in Louisville, Kentucky, of all places, in July 1956. And uh, another example of, of Parker pulling a lot of different themes together in one photograph. Certainly, he's, he loved physical plant. And here's a nice shot of uh, some of the physical plant involved in running steam, namely the water column, uh, which is being manhandled by the guy up on top of the tender of the uh, switcher. Uh, but what really strikes me is that jaunty pose, almost like he's a professional model of the other trainmen there in the foreground standing in front of the uh, in front of the water column and really quite smartly dressed for a day of switching, I might add. Uh, we're gonna look now at one of my favorite Parker Lamb images. Uh, who else but Parker Lamb would would come across this and 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 blur the train and focus on the people? This is uh, this is uh, McNeil, Texas, on the edge of Austin. And a uh, Southern Pacific local had got there first and was switching, and the Texas Eagle had to wait its turn. But when the freight got out of the way, the automatic interlocking did not clear for the Eagle. So we have a signal maintainer sitting on the uh, uh, train order delivery stand, a, uh, a suited train master, uh, the uh, a trainman from the Eagle, and then this delightful pot-bellied, pith-helmeted station agent are all sitting there I don't know, discussing the weather while they wait for for the uh, the clock to run on the red signal. And and I I think it's part of his 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 uh talent that Parker would blur the train I uh and focus on the people. I never get tired of watching this or looking at this. And one thing I love about that photograph, Fred, too, is I just love to speculate on how irritated all those passengers are getting sitting back there on the Eagle wondering, what in the hell are we doing here? <laughs> they're, they're probably all in the vestibule to get off in Austin five minutes later. Yeah. Here's another shot that combines uh, a lot of things, mainly 
Parker Lambs love the physical plant. We're uh, in um, Bloomington, Illinois, on the GMO in the foreground. That's a northbound GMO passenger train. Crossing in front of it are a couple of Jeeps on the New York Central's Peoria and Eastern. So much to see here uh, the multiple diamonds, the switches, the layout of the complete interlocking. Uh, but what really makes the photograph to me are the people in the foreground. All of us who are old enough remember what classic old crew changes looked like. And, and uh, Parker caught a dandy one here with several railroaders chatting before their runs out on the platform. And then this wonderful addition of a couple walking along the platform to the left. So uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of machinery going on here, but also a lot of, of humanity. And uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful trademark of Parker's. What you see next could be any of us and it definitely was me. We're in Tolono, Illinois, where the Illinois Central, just south of Champaign, crossed the Wabash. You can see the interlocking machine at the operator's uh, uh, left hand, but it's, it's the boy leaning on the train order uh, lever. Uh, the backstory of this is that Parker was there, the kid was there, and he, he saw the boy entranced by the operator, and he slowly backed off raised his camera and got this image. He wrote on the back of the print that he sent to trains, this was not posed. Uh, <laughs> it's great. Yeah, like you say, Fred, we've all been that kid at one point in our life, yep. if we were lucky. Here's a shot that uh, Morgan included in a wonderful picture, pictorial story called an IC 2600 Spectacular. It was a few pages dedicated solely to Parker's photographs of IC-482s, and this one struck me in particular. Of course, it's another example of Parker's skill at taking the pan shot. But what really I love about it, being an upper Midwesterner, is the lousy weather. It's a cold day. Uh, you can see how much steam and condensed steam is combined with that smoke laying back over that boiler. Uh, you can see the canvas uh, curtain there back in the gangway and the very simple utilitarian lines of these home-built 482s. And, uh, and of course, this is very late in the game. This, this locomotive wouldn't be around much longer after he got this photograph, but what a heroic way to go out, uh, thanks to Parker. Parker was never scared of bad weather. Uh, as you'll see in this next image, uh, it's the Blue Streak merchandise of Southern Pacific approaching Hearn in Central Texas in 1967. Uh, it uh, it was a hot day, and uh, Parker had his camera on the tripod, and then the clouds started to empty, and the rain started when the train was about a, a mile away. All he did was open the aperture some, slowed the shutter to one thirtieth of a second, and waited till the train came around the curve at seventy, and he got it just as it split the signals. What this means to me is is what it symbolizes to me is speed because the image you see is ever so slightly blurred and you see it particularly in in the uh, headlights and this is an example of of how he he makes you see something that's not evident i mean most of the time we we freeze a, a train that's moving and you don't get the sensation of speed but you do here uh, i like this so much that uh, i I made this a full page uh, uh, photo in the opener of a chapter on my book called Southern Pacific's Blue Streak Merchandise. And on the opposite page, the title of the chapter was No Guts, No Glory. And this was the perfect image for that, for that uh, opening spread. It's a shot I liked for very personal reasons. My father, uh, my father's father and his grandfather, in other words, my grandfather and great grandfather were both towermen on this Chicago and Eastern Illinois. And, you know, Parker went to college in Champaign for a while. So a lot of the stuff he shot was on the CNEI. And I love this shot because uh, for one thing, it shows the CNEI with some really pretty decent scenery. The CNEI wasn't always the most scenic railroad in the world. Here we see the Meadowlark, the northbound Meadowlark that come up from Southern Illinois crossing the Vermilion River, coming into Danville, which was the operating headquarters of the railroad in March, 1959. And uh, 
it's, it's a great shot. It's another example of Parker getting out and, and making the most of whatever the weather had to give him. In this case, a sunny morning, but the, the sun isn't really facing the right direction. That didn't stop Parker. He, got a, he did a nice job of kind of catching the chill in the air. You can see the frost on the cross ties. And uh, this is one of my, this is a, just a wonderful way to evoke the old CNEI. I agree with you. Um, what we see next is uh, uh, something right out of right out of hell. This is Twin Seams Mining in Kellerman, Alabama. Uh, it could be 1910, it could be 1920, but it was really 1960. And Twin Seams was on its last legs uh, as a company. And so, so was this railroad, as you can see. That they were down to one Shea locomotive. Uh, and it seems like it's almost coming out of a tunnel, doesn't it? With all that smoke uh, surrounding it and and the vegetation, I particularly like uh, I particularly like uh, photographs that that of weedy uh, rights of way where the photographer gets down low and emphasizes the weeds. Uh, this is a, a great example of that. Wonderful shot. Yeah, and it looks like the, the railroad's barely in business. And of course, it didn't last much longer after that. It had a connection with the GM and O. Uh, so I think this is a, a little west of Birmingham, Alabama. But yeah, you're, that's a great shot of uh, of a fairly uh, tentative little operation. Somewhat in the same ilk is this wonderfully f flavorful photograph uh, of the uh, on the Bonhomie and Hattiesburg Southern, a short line in Mississippi. Uh, this taps into Lamb's southern essence lamb was very much a southern photographer and uh there weren't that many of them as accomplished as him from that region of the country uh, and of course the bonhomie and hattiesburg southern what a what a wonderfully flavorful name for a mississippi short line what i love about this shot is that uh maybe partly dictated by the uh, the situation parker had to stand back quite a ways because of the trestle and all the undergrowth and i love the fact that the train and the water tank and the water column and everything are way in the background and he really gives you a chance to see the train and the steam engine in the entirety of its environment and uh, the other thing i like about this photograph is if you showed it to me i, I might guess that it was taken in 1905 uh, not in 1958 which is am amazing to me and we thought enough of this photograph to include it on the uh, back cover of our book during the 1980s parker seemed to disappear at least from my perspective, from the pages of Trains Magazine, I wondered if he had died. Then one day I picked up a Railfan magazine uh, in the in the uh, Jim Boyd era, and there was a wonderful Parker Lamb feature story uh, about the Katy uh, in Central Texas uh, around Granger and Austin. This is Granger. Uh, there are so many things I, to like about this: uh, the uh, the uh, cantilevered signal, uh, the semaphores. Uh, the uh, the man getting down from the cab, the other fellow leaning against the uh, the shed, and of course the wonderful uh, FA locomotive, and of course the weedy right away, and, and Parker got down a load to photograph it. Uh, it caused me uh, I was at that time working on the book about the Blue Street merchandise, so I I found I I found out how to contact Parker and asked if he had uh, any Blue Streak merchandise photos, and did he ever? And uh, uh, what you see here is labeled as the Blue Streak, but I'm looking at a, a pile of automobile cars in that consist, and it, I I question whether it is. But we're in we're in eastern New Mexico, which is one of the dullest, least scenic places on the face of this earth, and yet he still made this good. I, what what strikes me is the diesel exhaust as it fights its way up a grade. Uh, it 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 kind of mutes the the emptiness of of the uh, of the landscape and emphasizes uh, that string of uh, of EMD locomotives. This is a nice shot. Uh, it, it turned out that uh, I got to ride the Blue Streak from Pine Bluff to, to El Paso twice. The first trip was so uh, was so beset by delays that my benefactor at Southern Pacific, Roland Breedenberg, said, Fred, I'm embarrassed. Would you ride the train again? I said, I'll ride it 10 times if, we could, if you'd let me. And so in both cases, uh, Parker met the train in Tyler, Texas, and rode it to San Antonio. Uh, this is the the pilot on the on the first Blue Street, 
the assigned engineer uh, out of Tyler was unfamiliar with the railroad between Tyler and, and Corsicana. So Ron Lumens, who looks like a small town Texas banker, was was brought on to uh, run the train and, and uh, acquaint the, en the assigned engineer with with the route to Corsicana. The Corsicana. Any rate, he, he cuts quite a figure here with a Stetson hat, uh, a leather jacket. He had uh, nice, nice irons, a uh, uh, pair of pants on. Uh, strange he didn't have a tie. What he said, I've been with this railroad 19 years, and I'm still on the extra board. He had worked all over the railroad when he couldn't get work out of Tyler. Quite a guy. This shot is in Austin, Texas, and uh, I, I'm glad we're using this just to kind of bring back some memories for me of spending some time in, in, in Austin with Parker. I visited him twice down in his hometown in the late 90s and early 2000s, and we had a wonderful time. He was a wonderful host. What I remember perhaps most of all was the couple of really cool barbecue joints he took me to. Uh, but there was also this wonderful photograph. Now, I, I have to say, I never saw this sign. I wish I did. I think it was long gone by the time I visited Parker. But here's his wonderful photograph of the Eagle pulling into the station there in town with this outrageously, uh, uh, you know, ornate uh, neon sign that the Mopac put up alongside the street there. And there's also the Pullman Standard uh, Planetarium Dome car there yeah. in, in gorgeous Jake's now. blue paint. <laughs> Now we're back at McNeil, McNeil, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is another shot of McNeil, and and this is one of the places I have I spent a little bit of time one afternoon with Parker. McNeil is still there. It's lost some of its character because now the SP line in the foreground that's crossing, which was a branch out to the hill country, out toward Marble Falls, there's now a flyover here uh, for the uh, transit system of Austin. So the flavor's gone, but it, this was a wonderful. Even as late as the year 2000, McNeil was a pretty cool place to hang out, including uh, the station, I believe, is gone, but there's a little post office off to the side where you could buy a soda pop and mail your letters and uh, and watch trains. Is that you sitting on the station there? <laughs> almost, it almost could be, but no, I was uh, about 10 years old, I think, when he took this photograph. And not far from McNeil is... Um, the big suburb of Round Rock, of course, in this photograph, showing a motley uh, bunch of EMD engines uh, pulling a freight train through uh, through Round Rock. It looks like it's a fair, fairly rural scene, but anybody who's been down around Austin knows that Round Rock is now a gigantic exurban suburb, and uh, and uh, this this sort of scene certainly can't be repeated. But but what a wonderful way to get so many things involved in the photograph. Not not only the train or the, not only the signal by the station and all the the, the diesels on the train, but also that wonderful car in the in the foreground, I think it's a Ford. <laughs> I love that. I'm drawn, oddly enough, to the Missouri Pacific insignia on the station. Yes. There's another, it was a favorite location of Parker's. Uh, they, there's another photograph in the collection of, of the Eagle uh, meeting a freight train there, Eagle, of course, being in the siding. Um, we've, we've talked about Parker as if he were in the past tense, he's he is uh, 87 years old. Uh, he's with us, but uh, sadly, he's he's not with us. He's he's has dementia, uh, and uh, still lives in Austin. I have many uh, fond memories of the guy uh, because once he we got together and collaborated on the BSM book, uh, he would always let me know when he was going to be at an academic conference in Washington. And uh, we go out to dinner. And the amazing thing about him is he is so urbane and intelligent that he charmed my wife. And it's hard for a rail fan to ch charm my wife, but Parker did it. And the, the wonderful thing about dining with him is that you, you're in a you're in a nice fancy restaurant and Parker is talking as if he's lecturing a, a, a hall full of mechanical engineering students and invariably the entire restaurant would would uh, it would be listening into our conversation because <laughs> people had no choice what a guy uh, I, I, I miss his presence God bless him and I urge all of you who haven't uh, purchased this book to do it because uh, many of you know him 
all of you must be aware of his talent. And this is a perfect showcase of, of the man's artistry. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, talking about him, Kevin. Uh, and uh, uh, there's nobody like him. I agree, Fred. He was a wonderful guy. And I was so fortunate to get to know him by virtue of my job. Um, I also want to use this opportunity to, to give a shout out to the people involved in the book. First, yourself, Fred. Thanks for accepting our invitation to write that wonderful introduction. It was pure so, pleasure. Yeah, it was great working together with you again, buddy. Um, also, though, a, a shout out to Scott Lotus, who was our, our fearless leader on this whole project, as well as uh, Wendy Burton, who helped me with the photo choices. She was terrific in, in guiding us towards some of the best choices. And then, of course, her husband, Jeff Browse, who did a, a, his usual fantastic job, not only of designing the book, but also uh, managing all the production. And uh, it's a gorgeous production, and, and a lot of the credit goes to Jeff for that as well. And you did a great job of captioning, too, Kevin. It was fun. This one was a lot of fun. How could it not be, Fred, with, with a guy like Parker? Yeah, amen. Hey, Kevin, in your afterward, you spent a lot of time talking about uh, Parker's significance, particularly in the South. And I wonder if you might say just a couple of words about that, since we have a little extra time here. Yeah, well, uh, I, I tackled this idea of writing about Parker in the context of being a Southern photographer. Obviously, the context is easy when you consider how many subjects he shot in the South. And of course, there weren't that many photographers working in the South by measure of how much stuff came in to Trains Magazine over the years, which was usually my way of measuring these things. But also, I think Parker, uh, you know, loved where he came from and uh, embraced it and tried to show that in his photography. And in the uh, in the epilogue to the book, I try to explore Parker a little bit in the context of some of the other better known names from the uh, from the South that uh, that he must have been influenced by as he read earlier issues of Trains Magazine. And Fred, I don't know if this is one you'd want to take, but uh, I mean, I think one of the things that really strikes me about Parker's work is he was one of the the first photographers to really fully embrace the diesel. And I think that was one of the reasons Morgan used his work so much uh, in addition to just how good it was. But I don't know if either of you might say a little bit about um, uh, Parker's photography, particularly in the diesel era at a time when a lot of uh, longtime railroad photographers were dealing with the frustration of losing steam and kind of the uh, perceived lack of visual interest that brought along. I, I once uh, came across remembered a uh, Lucius BB letter to Trains Magazine uh, saying that uh, when the last steam locomotive image has been found and enjoyed, that will be the end of, of, uh, of rail fanning. Uh, Parker, <laughs> like me, looked at it differently. Uh, he, steam was by and large gone from Meridian by the time he got on that bicycle. Uh, well, that I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the, as I said earlier, the Southern Railways all dieselized uh, quicker than those in other regions. They had to, and and he he saw the beauty in the diesels. They, they weren't an intruder in his life. They they were part of what he was used to as as he uh, was a teenager and 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 becoming a young adult. And so he had no problem at all with with the diesel locomotive. He uh, he. He lo loved the colors, and he, he loved to, uh, to play with the light on, on the engines. Um, he was, I always considered him of the, what would we call it, the new era. If you say, so. if, you, if BB was the old era, then uh, 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 Parker was the new. I'd like to come back to this photograph from Bloomington for just a second. One of the the fun things about putting together this show and, and putting together the whole conference and, and kind of riffing off of our connections theme is that uh, this photograph, I think, struck a, a bit of a connection with Ken. And uh, Ken, if you're on here, would you like to say a little bit about uh, your connection to Bloomington and, and this photograph in particular? Yeah, I was uh, I was struck by when we were going through the rehearsal for this and I said, I know that spot. And I pulled up uh, some pictures I took on a trip there in 1986. Let me and, stop sharing my screen and maybe you can show us a couple of those. It, uh, it gave some context. Um, let's see if I can share. One second. I have to take over control of the share. 
You're a control freak. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. So these are and, and amazingly, so I had one print that uh, that I showed that I pulled them up to show them that, that day that we were going through this. And amazingly, I found the negatives from that trip. Uh, of course, I also found the notes which say. See also the Kodachromes, which I can't find, but that's a whole nother matter. That's part of my project and actually part of what I'm going to be talking about later today. But this is the uh, this is the station that. Um, that uh, the Parker was the, was visiting, and uh, it's also the Eastern Division offices of the GMNO. It was a beautiful building. It's such a shame that all of this is gone. It's completely gone. There's the there's the bridge that he was standing on. Um, it was just a stunningly beautiful building, and the whole area has changed. This was classic railroading in the 80s. Um, I I can't believe I didn't take more pictures of the details of this because. It is such a classic, wonderful mess of railroading. The signals, the wires, the crossings, the just, just tremendous mess. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was very like this was a great picture. That uh, let me zoom in on this one piece just quickly here. Like I, I said, this is like an insurer's nightmare uh, or dream, depending on your perspective. It's just like all this homemade random stuff just all over the place still, even in 1986. Um, and uh, let's see if we can find a couple of oh yeah here's the here's the view from the from the other side, and of the bridge where he was standing to take that picture. And there was a there was a, a berm that was built up into the second floor of the station had a freight house underneath. Um, it was just a beautiful building, and it's just a shame that this is just completely gone. And I'll just show one one brief picture. Uh, or I can show you a picture of oh, actually just briefly. Uh, so there's a, the the uh, the yards nearby were just being just torn down. It's a wonder I didn't you know get killed. Um, yeah, I I just when we talked about this that it was as empty then as as it must be right now. It was like a, a after the zombie apocalypse. There wasn't a soul around, which was remarkable. Um, there was a, a couple of the uh, GMO had shop uh, diesel shops there. And huge shops there, right? And then they had some very interesting equipment laying around. So this was one heck of a big steam, a tender from a big steam locomotive, and a just a massive plow to hit handle those uh, uh, mid mid uh, midwinter central Illinois storms. Um, the uh, the shops were just a complete mess. Uh, the the remnants of them just completely falling apart. Um, what a shame! It's just a beautiful stonework uh, in these buildings. You just think of all the history, all the cars and and, and locomotives that had been made and rebuilt there. Um, and then here's um, and here's one last picture that gives me a little bit more of an overview of exactly where Parker was standing when he took the picture. He stood probably right where that person is standing on the bridge, right there, looking um, in the direction that the train is facing, at the crossing, right there at uh, at, at this crossing. Uh, I'll let, I'll let the the image fill fill in a little bit. Right, basically the train was going right where where he where he shot, and that's all now single track. All this has changed. I'll just show you briefly an overview of what this area looks like now. I just looked on Google um, Maps the other day, and this spot right in the middle. So you can see single track crossing each direction. The the bridge is still here, but that bridge is a, a pedestrian bridge. That's where roughly where the the concrete bridge was. This grassy area where this curve is now a, a riding and walking path. That's right where the station was. Um, there's just there's just houses. All this it was all torn down. There was a big candy factory that it had burned down, and the whole area that had many many jobs and uh, a lot of rail activity is just uh, a suburbia. Never Tim, a couple of, couple of questions have come in while you've been talking. Okay. Uh, one, I'll need someone who knows uh, Illinois better than I do to answer this one, but was the Peoria and Eastern train, was that on the nickel plate or were those P&E tracks through there? P&E, I believe. This was the GM&O, wasn't it? The GM&O is going, the train was on the GM&O, but the, the Peoria and Eastern train uh, in Parker's photograph that was that was passing with the Jeeps. I don't know the answer to that, guys. No, 
Yeah, but somebody know. does. <laughs> I'm sure somebody does. <laughs> I'll call Dave Ingalls when we're done here. He'll know. <laughs> oh. Ken, you also have a, a fan of the Bronica on your desk. Do you want to say anything about your Bronica <laughs> camera back there? I will. I'll get to that. And I'll actually get. I'll get to that. Um, okay. In, in your in your presentation. As part of my show and tell, my informal Excellent. show and tell. Uh, Michael Wilson notes that uh, most of uh, Parker Lamb's photographs, he framed everything and anything he could in relation to the subject. Um, and uh, he's just wondering, Fred and uh, and Kevin, if if one of you might say something about um, that framing being a trademark of Parker's style. Kevin, well, I, it, it certainly was a trademark because we looked we looked through literally, literally hundreds of shots for choosing stuff in this book and. And it's, if you look at all of it in its entirety, you can see that there's three or four approaches that Parker not only mastered, but really began to lean on. There's certainly the cover shot looking under the train at another train. Uh, as Fred talked about earlier in another shot, uh, looking between the cars at another train coming at you, as, as something Wally Abbey did on a couple of occasions. Uh, he used single masts, signal masts, especially cantilever and bridge signals to frame things. Uh, he was he was really uh, quite clever at that sort of thing, and um, I think he probably did it partly because of where he happened to be at various times. There wasn't necessarily a lot of spectacular scenery around, so the only way to get some sort of visual reference into his photographs beyond the simple inclusion of the train, which we all know how big a train is, was to throw something else in there or look underneath or look around or come in from the other way. And uh, I, I think it was a really, I think it was, he was very clever at it. And I think he was definitely ahead of the game in that sort of approach. I, I can't help but think that his, his uh, penchant for framing trains or photographs had to do with his mechanical engineering instinct. Yeah. I see, I see a note, by the way, that the uh, P and E tracks are now gone. Thanks to Conrail. Well, Kevin and Fred, thanks very uh, both of you very much for sharing uh, your thoughts and and some of your uh, memories of Parker. Uh, certainly one of the fantastic photographers of the of the twentieth century. And again, I'll uh, I'll just take the opportunity to plug the book again. A lot of our publication orders are going to be delayed uh, during our, our current work from home situation. However, we do have a book distributor for the Parker Land book as well as our book and their factories remain open and their warehouse is open. So we should be able to fulfill orders for BB and Clay as well as Parker Land pretty quickly. Everything else will ask your patient patients as we're uh, going into our offices on a very limited basis in Madison right now. Uh, but certainly if you don't have the Parker Land book yet, uh, we'd love to. Uh, get you connected with a copy of it and we'll gladly accept those orders. Kevin and uh, and Fred, thanks again. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Scott. Had a had a lot of fun. Appreciate it.